After reflecting on the last five decades, I've come to realize that I have a story. One of my music and my sound, and the marvelous collaborations with friends and colleagues. With a little help from these friends, I will share with you the journey that has shaped my musical life. I suppose every musician has a story, and my story is not new, but it is mine. Welcome to The Path Taken, hosted by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. Hello, folks. This is another episode of The Path Taken. And this one, we're going to take a deep dive in the Tom Farley recording by the fence in the sun. So, I am Alton Riddick. This is Tom Farley. So, how are you doing, Tom? Doing well, man. I've been looking forward to this one. Uh, it's uh, really special. Uh, they're all special, but this one, uh, you know, is getting more close to the present day. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fun it's, – it was, it was a fun experience. Well, I'm glad to hear it, man. Glad to hear it. I've been looking forward to this one, too. Again, I listened to it two or three times to get prepared for this. So I, before we even get started, I want to make sure that you know you are like a fine wine. You get better with age. And I hope you saw what I did there. You see what I did there? Yeah, I saw what you did there. (laughs) (laughs) And if you don't know what I just did there, it's coming. So um, be patient with us. But that was an inside joke that won't stay inside too long. But this is a really good record. I mean, a really good record. Top to bottom. Top to bottom. Like, the, you recorded yourself well. Um, the performances were good. Well, you know, we can always expect the performances to be good. And the mix is really good. And I was like, this is, this is, I can, I can hear you progressively getting better. Even at your age, most people don't do this, man. You're a special guy. What do you think? Well, I mean, it was, th- this particular one was released in uh, uh, 2016. That's 10 years after the Over the Falls album. So there, there was a lot going on in, from t- uh, 2006 to 2016. All of it good as far as the music is concerned. Uh, I was really fortunate to to reconnect uh, and uh, with old friends that I had had great uh, you know recording or uh, stage experiences with. I had a chance to <clears throat> excuse me to get new people on board like Joanna Benford who we had never recorded ever before, which is great. Um, you know, Richard Spano uh, did bass tracks for one of the songs. Uh, there were a lot of people that were involved in this, but all the people who were involved were, uh, a lot of them were people who were had, had been with me all, all along. Steve Gallagher, Todd Gallagher, Donnie Satterwhite, and also Greg Weichel, uh, who I reconnected with, uh, which was an incredibly special thing. He is all, His presence is all over this album, and it should be. He's an incredible talent. Uh, you know, it was a benchmark moment in a lot of different ways. Uh, first of all, you got all these new artists that I'm going to be recording with that, uh, you know, for the very first time, which is great, but also, um, it's a, it's a landmark moment for Tanya and I, uh, you know, we've been playing together and recording together for decades and, uh, for the very first time, except for one track, uh, which David Edwards, uh, you know, put in uh, one harmony, one uh, of a three-part harmony, uh, Every single bit of the vocals on this album were done by Tanya and I, all three parts, uh, whether they be background vocals or, you know, three-part harmony on the lead vocals, it doesn't matter. Every single vocal lick in there were the three of us, were the two of us, excuse me, doing three-part harmony. And I can't tell you how much fun that was and how that evolved into that situation was, is also a really good part of the story. It sounds good, man. Yeah, because I mean, I remember him uh, putting this in my notes about your backing vocals. Um, they're always good. It's always part of my favorite. I mean, who says the backing vocals are really good? But I do. And so for me, I was like, on this one in particular, top to bottom, they were really, really good. But the biggest thing I, I remember feeling like and wanting to talk to you about in general, before we get into the, you know each track or whatever like we usually do, is – Tell me if I'm wrong, but this record is extremely reflective. It seems like you were in a place in your life where you could look at your rear view and have a different type of wisdom about it. Is that true, or is there something else happening? No, that's that's totally spot on, man. Uh, you uh, you know me pretty well. Uh, there was a lot going on in my life uh, during that particular time between 2006 and 2016. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. 
uh, I, you know, grew and, and started writing. Did a lot of the writing for this album in 2015, at the beginning of the year, because of some events that happened that just kind of, you know, brought the muse, you know, put her on my shoulder and we let it rip. But there is an awful lot of a reflection in this. There's reflection on uh, from, for my mother. There's reflection in terms of my dad. There's reflection in my time at Wesleyan. Um, in terms of uh, reflection, uh, like moving on uh, as, a, as a tune, is a reflection tune because I had several, several people who were in my circle for many, many decades had passed away that year between 2015 and the release in 2016. So, you know, those, those moments and, and those things uh, really impacted me a lot. But the neat thing about it, Alton, as, as you know with me, um, I'm retired now. So I actually had the time to reflect. I, I consider that one of my greatest, uh, I guess you could say, luxuries. The fact that I can actually sit back and, and think about things, um, you know, in depth uh, to, to actually, you know, weave that pattern of, of, of connections and intersections and stuff like that. Uh, and also, you know, to, to go back in the history, whether it's personal history or musical history, I can go back and I can see the videos of these people or these things, and I can hear the recordings of the people and the things. And, and it just, you know, it just was uh, uh, the, the perfect period and the perfect timing, you know, for a reflective album to come out. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, okay. I, I get that. And I'm glad I was right because uh, you have laid down more than just like Easter eggs about it. Interesting enough, every song, including the instrumentals, is always, it just seems like you're thinking about what has happened. You are processing, still processing, you know, what has happened in your life in that time period. And I thought that was really important to ask to kind of set, you know, kind of set the tone for this particular record because the whole record is, this has happened, this is how I felt about it, this is what I feel about it now. Um, we'll, we'll get into it because there's a couple of songs, especially one in particular, that is just like, this has happened to me. Now I'm older. How is it affecting me now? And this is how it's affecting me. So, yeah, I just wanted to ask that, make sure that, you know, I was on the right track. But um, you you definitely did a great job of putting hardship, pain, and, you know, some it seems like withdraw, just thinking, reflecting, and coming back, coming through the other end and in lyrics and doing it very well. It, it was a really, really good record. It was it, – it, it's funny to say some someone it, it, with your stature – at this point in your life can still be growing, but that's a good thing. And I can, I can tell, I mean, if you just listen to it, well, if you're using this as your first one, maybe not, but if you have gone through it chronologically, it's, it's more than incremental. It, it, it's big. I understand. And you're right. Uh, it's, it's really kind of weird. I mean, I knew that was kind of the path that the, that the album and the songs were taking. Uh, and I don't, I don't know whether it's consciously or unconsciously, but, I, I knew I needed a new sound, but I also needed, knew I needed support. I mean, I always have Tanya there to support me, but for this one, I really needed something just just rock rock solid, you know, uh, in my corner. Now, that's not saying that anybody that was on the album wasn't rock solid. What it means is, like, this is the first album that I, re that I recorded with Pete Schonard. Pete and I have been playing together for decades and never got in the studio, but having Pete there, man it it just made things so easy and he understands me musically and personally also very very well and was able to put in the moves and the sounds that that he knew that I wanted and needed uh you know to have that kind of of, of personnel that kind of friendship that kind of you know musical collaboration uh with him and all the others was an incredibly supportive thing uh it would be terrible if any of these songs uh, came out, you know, uh, and fell flat, you know, or or f fell short of what they what it actually they actually could have been, and because of uh, uh, the people who were involved, um, and of course uh, with Tanya's support and criticism along the way, uh, it didn't. It, it ended up being something really great, uh, and uh, you know, I I thank my uh, my lucky stars for having these people and the situation around. I, I believe that because I mean. We don't really do anything by ourselves in this life to start with, but when it's hard, we really need a support system to get things done. I mean, don't get me wrong. You can do it by yourself, but you can't do it right. So that's the difference. There's a lot of 
there, the people who are on this have we have a, you know a deep personal history as well as a deep musical history, and it's nice to be able to know that when there's a lyric or a music passage or something like that that has an emotional quality that needs to be brought out, then they know exactly what the hell to put in there. I mean, you know, that's that just comes with time. It comes with experience and working and playing with each other. It comes from uh, the, the fact that uh, some of these people are also really great songwriters. Uh, and they understand where I'm coming from when I when I actually place these things in their path. So, yeah, I, you know, they, they're an exceptional group of people. Exceptional. I can tell. I mean, if you listen to the record, even if you listen to the record as a one shot, just standalone, it's still great. So, um, as we do, one track at a time. So the first track, By the Fence in the Sun, which is the title track. Yeah, man. Um, for me... Initially, when I'm listening to it, this is definitely a sitting on the porch with mom and brother picking and grinning type of song. Oh, yeah. It kind of moves along. Just it feels easy. It feels like Sunday afternoon. It feels like, you know, fun. Um, the other thing that I noticed in it, this I, I presume this is, you know, a message as message as far as remembering your dad. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because I recall times, you know, with my dad working hard, it was never fun, as you said. So I'm glad that you had fun working hard with your dad. I never had fun <laughs> like that. It was always work. It still was. It still is in my memory. However, what I did relate to was the fact that, like, when you get older, especially, well, my dad's still alive. So when you get older, when I got older, as I get older, I look at those times and they're, they are more than just the work that was happening at the time. Oh, yeah. Even though I can't say the work was fun, I can certainly say our relationship in an odd, like, osmosis type of way kind of got better. The bond, oh, yeah. the, bond, the bond that was there was stronger than it was before we started the job. Well, it's not only stronger, but it's richer. Yes. You know, there, there, there's a depth to it that you never realized before. Um, that song has a, a lot. We've in, in previous podcasts we've talked about it. it is without a doubt. I think uh, my most uh, uh, remembered and special first take moment because it was an incredibly, you know, right off the chart, you know, first take moment with Greg. Um, <clears throat> but also, uh, it was it was just a day. You know, I, I used to go up to to the mountains with Tanya to, to visit my parents and my older brother and his family. And in Floyd County, they had a they had a farm up there, and it was wonderful. Uh, and, and you know, you just like something like missing my old man. Uh, you 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 uh, you realize uh, certain things like uh, uh, tools and and how to do this and measuring and materials. I mean, all that stuff that your dad taught you and that you that you kind of you know was the gopher you know for when he was on a project. Uh, uh, you're an adult now, so. Basically, it was it was him and me on an absolutely beautiful day, a little bit warm, but absolutely beautiful day, putting in 100 yards worth of electrical fence because the, the road up above the fence on the side of the hill, uh, people had pushed down so much rock uh, you know, that they used to cover the road. It actually kind of made the fence unsteady and, and pushed a couple of things out. So we took a bunch of locust poles. And a pole, a post hole digger, a hand one, not a, not the nice screw that you can put in the back of a tractor and zip, zam, boom. We did it all by hand. And so we started off in one end and used the entire day, you know, post hole digging, putting in the logs, stringing the wire, and eventually, you know, at the end of it, uh, could look back and see the work that we had done. Uh, that doesn't mean that we didn't talk about it. We talked all day long. I had him to myself, and I didn't realize... <sighs> I didn't realize how special that was until um, the song came, uh, and it was a great day. It was just a really great day, and people who sometimes just simply do not get themselves or have an understanding of the moment in which they live, uh, I didn't really realize the, the importance of all of that. Uh, I thought about it uh, on the way home. Of course, it's a long drive home. I thought about those things. But at the end of the day, it was a great day with just me and my dad. And, uh, you know, 
I think I, I think I caught it pretty good. I still, yes, you can tell, I still get choked up about it. But you know, at the end, that's something that, um, uh, you know, out of all the family stuff that I can truly say was just hours. You know, even though it was just an afternoon, it was a hell of an afternoon uh, where we did good work, had good conversation, and just enjoyed the out of doors and working on a farm. I understand. Like I said, I I see. As I get older, I see my life differently uh, with my dad as a youngster. I, I much more appreciate it now than I did then. And, you know, the older we both get. You know, I mean, my dad's in his mid-70s. I'm, I'm you know, cl- closing in on mid-50s or whatever it is. Think the, You know, you remember things differently or you remember things deeper. So I understand. And that's what, I, that's what resonated with me. Like I said, even though my father's still alive, we've had our moments where it's like, I, I totally get that day. I totally get that day. So... That's a that's a great song, and it was and it was a great song because of the lyrics and how you expressed yourself. Don't get me wrong; the performances were great. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is, the song resonates with people my age and older, because I think at my age, you just see your parents differently. I mean, all things being equal, now some parents aren't worth the you know the paper they're printed on. However, all things being equal. You start to see your parents differently. You start to appreciate those little moments because you know they're coming to an end at some point. So that's right. I get it. That's right. And uh, you know, um, he was until he had a stroke. He was very, very, very active on his farm. He had cattle. He had uh, he had little projects that he did, uh, whether it's for himself or my mother or for even for Tanya. Uh, helped my brother build his home. There was all kinds of things that he was into. And I think I caught him at the peak of that particular, you know, time in his life. He was he was strong, and he was vibrant, and uh, he he also, I'm sure, had had taken the time to reflect on things because the conversations that we had about his brothers, about his mom, uh, about things that were part of his past, uh, and also about the farm and what the farm meant to him, and it, and how he sees the farm at that particular time as as a vehicle for his happiness. Uh, those things were uh, those things were not talked about really before or even after, but th- that that particular situation provided the moment that was needed to for us to actually engage in those topics and, and do them in the most personal and satisfying way. Uh, uh, it just you know, what can you say? It was just great. One, two, three. Me and Daddy went and put us up a fence. Yards along the road, thinking we could maybe get a few things done with someone there to share the load, dig a hole and cut a log, put them in there one by one. It didn't take no time at all. Hard and having fun by the fence in the sun with my daddy. Out in Floyd, they put the rock down on the road. Help you make it through the snow A few days gone, I think there's gonna be some more Where in the world did it all go? Down in Jacksonville, they all lay out in rows Still together side by side How they got here, no one ever really knows did their best to love the ride. 
raise your head and say a prayer Send it to them one by one Always think of them as there Working hard and having fun By the fence in the sun Well, second track, here I go again. Um, the first thing that struck me was what I, you know, it struck me as far as what I wanted to ask you was, is the lyric in the middle of the river symbolic of something? Maybe like wisdom at, you know, your age, given your new perspective. Just, you know, tell us a story. What, what are the lyrics all about? Well, uh, to an extent, yeah, you're absolutely correct. So the first verse is about a canoeing trip that I went with, uh, with a good friends, Kim Fuller and Glenn Coates. Uh, we went up uh, off one of the uh, the branches, or I guess you could say the feeder streams that feeds into the uh, James River. I uh, went with about, I don't know, eight or 10 other people. Uh, went into a, yeah, slept in a cabin that, uh, you know, had no electricity, no nothing really. It was really just bare bones. Uh, you know, great uh, uh, food around the, the campfire and all the rest, that kind of stuff, you know. Uh, but that day that we went uh, on the canoe trip, uh, we were in the middle of this particular stream, which would be like in the middle of the river, and you could see both sides, and both sides had different animals and different vegetation, and and you can cruise along really at uh, at a really really nice pace. It wasn't like we were okay, let's get to the rapids so we can, you know, do a river wild scene or some shit like that. It was let's enjoy the nature, the natural moment, and really soak in exactly what what this whole area and what being around a river is all about. So in the middle of the river, that was, you know, my experience with, with Glenn and Kim. Uh, Kim and I were in one uh, canoe. Glenn was in a canoe with somebody else, and there were other canoes as well. But um, we, uh, we took the time to really, you know, soak in those moments and, and that particular surrounding scenery uh, to the absolute, you know, biggest advantage. It was a wonderful weekend, uh, one of the best I'd ever spent, certainly outdoors. Uh, the other one was um, there was a place outside of Blacksburg when I was going to school that um, uh, it was on a hillside, but it had this incredible view. I can remember going up there a couple of times, especially in the fall when the clouds were huge and gigantic and the cumulonimbus was just, you know, it wasn't cumulonimbus, just gigantic cumulus clouds. And, you know, you could sit there and they would float by like they were right in front of you. Uh, yet there was the valley that you could see all the way down. So when you sit there and you actually just see this, let nature just kind of flow by, rain clouds off in the distance, you can see the rain, but it's not hitting you. Uh, things like that uh, are just moments in nature that um, that somehow uh, bring a certain amount of realization, you know, the simple things in life that uh, that really should be the monikers for every single thing that you do. Uh, thinking in terms of, of the big picture, but also thinking in terms of uh, how you actually relate to the natural world and how that relationship can actually make you a better person. Who who played on this? Because it's not like the last record. It's not like Over the Falls where most of the players were loops. Or am I wrong? Because this sounds like 
you know, you had players. Oh, this is live and in color. There's no doubt about it. This is a great song um, uh, for for uh, the rhythm tracks, which basically are, are the the bass and the drum set. Okay, those were loops. So I, I pulled the trap set out and I made that the trap set for the album. But percussion I had Pete on percussion, and I Pete made a, a big difference because it was the first time that I ever really uh, consciously wanted to engineer his uh, kunga sounds because he has some really nice snappy kunga, kunga sounds very much in time. And I wanted them to bl- I wanted to blend those sounds, make them stereo, but blend them with the sound of the snare drum. So the snare drum was more than what it what it normally could be. So, you know, of course, Pete had other things going on percussion wise, but that really set that song apart. Stevie had background strings. Um, of course, I had my acoustic guitar, Tony and I on vocals. But the the lead part on there was done uh, by Joanna Benford, who I, you know, I gotten to know in, in the previous couple of years. And, you know, we gotten to be friends and really enjoy playing uh, music together. We, we kind of started off uh at the daily grind, just do it. She was come in and sit in with me on my solo act and me and her and Tanya would have a good time. Sometimes Richard Spano would show up. It was just a great relationship. And so bringing her in, you know, for, for that and tip of the hat, uh, were, were exceptional moments for me because I was able to work with a classically trained musician in creative ways that I had never really imagined before. Uh, Joanna is a very creative person. She's a Suzuki kind of, uh, uh, a musical uh, mind, so to speak. Uh, she plays, she's very much in the moment and plays and translates her feelings into her viola. And she also, uh, I was able to play lap steel on that in certain parts. And the one thing that I, I, you know, the lap steel was good, but it needed a little bit of a bump, so to speak. So I had her in in, in half of the, the uh, lap steel moments, especially in the first lead part. I had her play a harmonic uh, to follow the notes harmonic, you know, uh, just parallel the, the actual things I'm saying, but do it harmonically on her on her viola, and it came out sounding absolutely awesome. So I was able to, you know, to to you know make that a much more uh, a richer, I guess you could say, uh, feel to it, and also the sound, which is wonderful. So uh, at the end of the day, there was a lot going on with that, uh, and the players there were just, you know, everybody stepped up to the plate. It was it was a great that was a great experience. And uh, the fact that, you know, the, the lyric content kind of drives that because, you know, if you have that spirit of, of understanding and spirit of realization, especially when you're doing the singing of the, of, of the words, it really comes across with a lot more, I don't, I don't know about whether meaning was, would be the thing. It, it just seems so much more, uh, the, the vocals seem so much in touch with what the song is all about that it just comes out better. I can't put it any other way than that. I understand. It's a great song. This is a great track. And I thought that was her, but I didn't want to just guess, but I thought it was. I think the mix on that is the icing on the cake. Everything is blended really well. Well, I enjoyed doing that. I mean, you know, I, it's not just the volumes and, and uh, the pannings, but um, uh, I, I allowed, you know, Joanna, you know, to, to have her own creative devices. I mean, I didn't tell her I want this, I want that. She just came in with with a great idea already there. And so all I had to do was to make sure that I recorded it well. Uh, same thing, uh, you know, uh, uh, with uh, Tip of the Hat, which we'll get into in a little bit. But the thing is, is that she is very studio friendly. And uh, she also is very much into the creative moment. She was the new person. I mean, even though it was the first time uh, I had recorded in the studio with Pete, uh, it was uh, very much a a, a really uh, great moment for the two of us because uh, we we just had, uh, you know, we had a connection, you know, by playing live. But that's not like in the studio. Uh, there's a certain amount of confidence and a certain amount of trust that you put into, um, uh, you know, a session work that only comes with uh, that kind of communication and understanding that, uh, that, you know, that I have with the people that I'm playing with and other people have those connections too. So, uh, but it worked out wonderfully. She was, she's a great artist and, and still a good buddy. We still try and stay in touch as much as we can. I hear you. Great song. Great song. Great performances. Every, everybody. Um, I mean, it's just, it's just one piece and there that's saying a lot. Well, sometimes things sound disjointed in a way in which is not flattering. This is not one of those times. This is a good song. 
I think so too. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, you 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 key on certain songs when you're making the album, and you think, well, maybe one's better than the other, one, that kind of thing. But you know, it's all in. Uh, I remember Bob Smith when he I sent him a copy of the album, and the first thing out of his mouth, he says, "Man, I really love Here I Go Again." I mean, that was his, that was his favorite song off the album, bar none. Boom, right there, because he heard all these these other things that you could do to the song when you, if performing it live. You know, things that you could add. Uh, you know, little, which live performance, of course, lends itself to greater, you know, and different interpretations. But he loved it. And so that that really boosted my confidence an awful lot because I loved the song, but it wasn't, you know, I guess you could say uh, my number one choice, it, it, even if I could do a number one choice. Um, it, 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 it's just, you know, that, that felt good for him to say that. Well, actually, I want to piggyback on that. Any of these songs, they're really, really good. And they're, like you said, they're really live oriented and they lend themselves to be performed live. Yep. Do any of these songs give you the itch? It's like, man, if I was like 10 years younger, boy, oh boy, those would be fun. You have any of those, you know, moments? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, we had the ability, um, uh, shortly after the release of the album to, to put together the high energy acoustics band. And we were able to do uh tip of the hat. Uh, I'll remember. And, um, let me see. High School Heart. Uh, those were the tunes that we off the album that we were actually able to put together and get album quality you know, versions of. But I mean, you know, uh, to, to take these songs and uh, take those particular versions, put them in, put them right there uh, as, OK, this we're going to do these just like that. And then all of a sudden uh, come up with the with the configuration of musicians and stuff like, and, and instruments and stuff to be able to play all the rest of them. Oh, man, uh, that would be great. I mean, I have often, you know, and of course, a band like the High Energy Acoustics Band would be the perfect band, you know, for this because a lot of the people who were on the um, By the Fence and the Sun album were in that band. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, yeah, to, to, does it give me an itch? I don't know about the itch thing, but, you know, if I ever got an opportunity, if somebody actually wanted to put up the money and say, let's do a concert and get some of your best original material out there, I know exactly who I would ask. I would also add a keyboard player, uh, you know, and, and, and make this a really great performing situation, a, a great experience. Uh, but, you know, uh, I think about it, but, I, you know, the itch isn't so strong that I have to scratch it to the point of realization. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of other things going on right now in life. Understood. Understood. But I had to ask because these are good songs. <laughs> yeah, they are. And they, they are fun to do. There's no doubt about it. In the middle of the river, I can see both sides. In the middle of the river, I can roll with the tide. In the middle of the river, I can see things clear. In the middle of the river, I can feel you are near. Oh, I, I try to explain Oh, my, my walk in the rain Getting by with the loss and the gain Gonna fly right out of my 
back and watch the birds fly On the side of a mountain I can see the clouds cry On the side of the mountain The valley lies low On the side of the mountain You can see where to go Oh, I, I try to explain Oh, my, my walk in the rain Getting by with the loss and the gain Gonna find Tip of the hat. Um, this is another song that's definitely reflective, and it gives me a lot of sharp imagery. I mean, with a lot of clarity to it. Because I feel like I'm sitting around a campfire after a long day of cattle herding. That's the feel. <laughs> I hear you. And it's like this song was was written well before Yellowstone was a show. And so I'm and I'm like, man, where do, and the reason I'm going this route is like. Where was the inspiration for the rhythm of the chord progression? Or were you just noodling around? Well, um, I guess, you know, one thing I love to do, uh, you know, not all the time, but every once in a while, I'll just grab my guitar and just start working on different rhythm moves. And uh, that one just kind of came out of, I don't know where it came from, but I loved it when I first stumbled on it. Um, And it was... I guess you could say it was it was uh, it provided. I mean, the the actual rhythm pattern wasn't locked down until I actually started phrasing uh, the the lyrics the way that I wanted to, and once that happened, it just locked in. It was perfect. Uh, it's also I, I think a, it's a unique kind of rhythm, especially when you, the only music that you have going on is uh, you know an acoustic rhythm guitar and a viola. Uh, so it has to have a full sound, which, of course, that Guild F50 Jumbo, it gives a full sound. There's no doubt about it. And, um, you know, the viola is, is the perfect complement to all of that. Uh, it, the two instruments sound absolutely wonderful together. So, yeah, I mean, that particular, you know, being a rhythm guy, uh, I'm really proud of that song because it does establish a rhythm part that is, I think, distinctive. It's genuine. And I think it's, I think it's well recorded uh, simply because, you know, we spent some time on uh, re- making sure we recorded that right. I hear you. And you're right. It is actually the whole record is recorded well. And and I want people to understand, to my knowledge, you're still in your own studio with this. This is not Bob Smith's place. This is not anybody else's place. Oh, no. This, this, is this was at you. the Cosmopolitan. Right. Absolutely. And, and I've, been to, I've been to that dwelling before. And there is no excuse for anybody to record poorly. Because you have a, you know, finger quotes here, a bad room. So I just wanted to put that out there. I appreciate that, man. You know, the neat thing about recording it at the Cosmopolitan was the fact that we did the entire album, every single song. And uh, uh, we were in a special spot, like on a corner. So uh, the room that we that we set up for the studio was a little bit more isolated than most. But, you know, not a single neighbor beside us, above us, or below us. None of them even knew that an album was even going on, which was actually really pretty cool, I thought. I mean, you know, it was great because I didn't hear them either, which is exactly what I wanted for the studio. But, you know, that was that was really kind of neat to actually do the entire process, whether it's uh, recording all the tracks or uh, or doing the mixes through the speakers and stuff like that. Uh, that was the perfect place for that. And, yeah, that was, that was definitely, um, you know, a Farley Music Services studio, you know, production, no doubt about it. 
And it was a good one. And the other thing I like about this particular track, you, you, you was telling people to kiss your ass. That was my favorite part. <laughs> I just want y'all to know y'all need to listen to this song just for that part. <laughs> well, I can tell you, uh, you know, the first the first verse um, about some people talk about letting it go. That that reminded me of my early days, the, the first couple of years in my men's group. Uh, you know, where we used to get together in conversations and uh, some people you just couldn't let things go or, you know, whatever. That 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 kind of brought that lyric out. But the second lyric, that's all about Wesleyan. Uh, I mean, I left Wesleyan. Uh, I resigned from Wesleyan. Um, and the bottom line is uh, that was, you know, it was it was an odd experience. I spent 28 years of my life at that institution, teaching, administering, advising. I was totally into that place, and it was good for me. Uh, I love the people that I work with, uh, the ones who mattered. But there are there were a lot of administrative assholes, and there were also people who, who I mean, when I taught there, I taught as an adjunct. I was, I was paid uh, on an assistant professor salary, but I was still an adjunct. But at the end of the day, uh, there are some people, no matter how good you teach, it doesn't matter because if you haven't got the PhD beside your name, then you ain't shit in their book. And I could care less about those people. Uh, those people meant nothing to me. Uh, the people who actually engaged in, in conversation, who sat in on my classes, who knew what the, that I was doing a good job and how, how good a teacher I was bringing it from a public ed- education situation, those were the people that I loved the best. And those were the people who respected me the most because they knew, they saw it. And they heard my students talking about it in their classes. So they knew I was doing a good job. So the hell with the rest of them. Uh, so at the end of the day, you know, I was, I, I was sad to leave that place. But, you know, that reflection on that, those particular moments, uh, I said, you know, this is something that's going to be said. I'm going to say it. I'm going to put it in the song. And I don't care <laughs> what, the, you know, what, the, what their response might be because it's the truth. You know, it's just the way things are. Yeah, you sure did. Kiss my ass. I was like, okay. Now that we got that out of the way. Yeah. Woo. But that's, that's a great tune, man. That's a great tune. But I promise you that's my favorite part every time I play it. I'm like, man, he don't like y'all. Well, I mean, you know, I, there's. I love the chorus part because there's so much truth in it. Uh, uh, you're not really living if you're living a lie. Uh, I mean, I know so many people who, who just do not – who live the lie all every single day of their lives and haven't got a fucking clue, pardon my French, about what, you know, living uh, the good life or living life that, that actually uh, is built upon great relationships and, and great conversations is all about. They got no clue uh, what that's all about. And I try to tell you the truth. I try and distance myself from those people because at the end of the day, I got a lot of really great stuff going on. I have my music. I got the podcast. I have my family. I have all these great things that are going on, and I don't need their crap and distraction, you know, to get in the way of what I consider to be a good life, a still formative life, a still creative life, and a still productive life. All they do is get in the way and eat up my time and my emotional energy, and I just, pff, I could do without that. I don't. I think most people could. You know, and so that's uh, that's another reason why, you know, you can't feel the breeze as the wind rushes by. I mean, they're just they're not uh, mindful of anything that is of any great uh, importance or, or I guess you could say anything of great worth uh, as far as living a good life is all about. I hear that. Sorry, I didn't mean to get on the soapbox, man. But I mean, that's just the way it is. Uh, t- life is too short and time is too precious you know, why waste it on people like that? You know, it's just, you know, it's a waste to do that. Truth. I cannot agree more. I cannot agree more. <laughs> you bring out the soapbox in me, man. Hey, man, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> that's why I exist, for your soapboxing. That's right. Uh Some people talk about letting it go And some people hide it where the light never shows Some talk and petition and some never care 
Life is a road sign, state of repair. Cause you're not really living if you're living a lie. And you can't feel the breeze as the wind rushes by. Don't try to determine or think it all through. A tip of the hat is all you can do. And sharing my mind The best conversations You ever will find Oh, some will dismiss you As less than you are But the ones that embrace you Are better by far We can try moving forward And keep it on track But we're always reminded It's the vision they lack So now I'm retired I'm finished at last So the dean and my AD Can both kiss my ass Cause they're not really living If they're living a lie And they can't feel the breeze as the wind rushes by Don't try to determine or think it all through A tip of the hat is all you can do Well, I'll remember. Um, tough song. Um, yeah. I, I presume your mom, you know, died from some sort of dementia or Alzheimer's? She died from Alzheimer's, yes. Okay, because I was – it took me back to my wife. Uh, Lauren experienced that with her dad. It wasn't pretty. Um, I don't think it ever is. No. So, you know, tell us a story. Well, I mean – and I mean, when I say tell us the story, I mean the story of the song, because there's a lot of her in that you remembering her. But there's also a lot of how the situation affected you then in the moment and affected you later on as an older man. That's what oh, I mean yeah. by tell us the story. Oh, yeah. Um, Tanya and I were the uh, uh, the closest, the primary caregivers for my mother and my father for the last five and a half years of their lives. I mean, they lived at Bay Lake. Uh, you know, which is assisted living uh, community uh, for a uh, short period of time. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we live with the with the, the impact of strokes and the impact of Alzheimer's for quite some time. We had conversations about it. Uh, it's impossible not to, especially if you've had a visit, you know, and, 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 and everything. Uh, you know, it puts a lot of stuff into perspective that you, you know, that you that you never thought you'd be thinking about, 
Plus, there's a line in the song that says, "Now I uh, now I think it's my uh, uh, as her favorite son." I, I'm not saying that I was her favorite son. I was her favorite son. I had her eyes. I had her smile. I have her arthritis. I have her, you know, all the ailments that she has, and the possibility of me also having Alzheimer's. That's been a topic of conversation for Tony and I uh, over off and on over many years. And so uh, uh, when I when I say, "Will I remember th- uh, the way we dance and all the rest of the things uh, that are part of the of the course?" Uh, that's very meaningful and that's very powerful to me because the possibility of, of me not being able to remember things, um, you find out with, about Alzheimer's that, you know, it's the short term. My mother could remember, you know, what she wore to her elementary school graduation when she was like eight years old or something, but she couldn't remember what she had for breakfast 10 minutes ago. So, uh, you know, there's a depth of memory and there's the short term memory thing also. but. Um, you know, I there are certain things. Uh, 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 there are certain things that actually push through. I remember a story about a man who had Alzheimer's, and whose wife had died, and he would, you know, who was being taken care of in a home. They found him. This is what's really so amazing about it. They found him at a florist. As a matter of fact, the florist called the home, and so the, the, when they actually got there. Um, they asked him what he was what he was doing at the florist, and his response was, "This is my wife and mine's anniversary. I always get her flowers." And it's like, where the hell did that come from? That guy had that depth of meaning and memory that you know he he'd never let that go, you know. And yeah, Alzheimer's completely blanks you out. You know, you you you'll end up you know forgetting how to swallow. I mean, it gets that that rough, that kind of thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, there are certain moments of love and tenderness and and care and things that just push through. Um, and that's to me is what the second verse or the second course is all about when it says, "I will remember all of these things," uh, because that's what love does. Truth. That was a. That's a. That's a deep song. Tough for people who have been touched by it in any way. It's 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 a whole lot of it's just a whole lot. Well, I've only performed that song publicly twice. Once was uh at the library, uh uh it was back in oh what, twenty thirteen, something like that, at the uh the Virginia Beach uh Central Library. And the other was at um uh the High NG Acoustic Band uh, concert. Both of them, I did solo uh, at the library, and I did it with uh, with Pete and Donnie Satterwhite on pedal steel uh, at in the concert, which is also an incredible first take moment. But when I did it at the library, there was a substantial audience there. There was at least 150, 200 people there who didn't know me from Adams because I hadn't really been playing all that much. And I put that song out there, gave it a little introduction to let them know what it was all about. I sang it, and at the end of it, There were people who knew. There were people who were crying. Uh, I wasn't. Thank, thank God. I mean, I was able to hold my shit together. You know, sometimes you get emotional ticks, and that just totally screws up your performance. But I didn't that day. And uh, I can tell that that song, the first time those people had ever heard it, that that song connected. Um, and also uh, it connected at the concert as well, of course, with the beautiful uh, um you know, Pete, it was just Pete and I on the recording, but, you know, Donnie Satterwhite is just uh, my good buddy and he knows my music and he just, he just sat in, he knew exactly what to play and it ended up being beautiful. So yeah, Alzheimer's sucks. Uh, My heart goes out to people who have it and those who, who have to deal with it and watch the decline of their loved ones. Uh, But, you know, cherish the moments folks, because, um, they they do come to an end. You know, there's no doubt about it. I hear you. Good song, tough song to write, I'm sure. Tough song to to live live through and be inspired to write. Um, tough song to talk about, man. I'm, it is. All of it is. I'm, an emo- I'm an emotional mess today, man. What can I say? Man, this record. <laughs> you're the one that wrote this. It's all your fault, bro. Mm. It's all your fault. I man. take it's, full credit and responsibility. I know you will. <laughs> Your name's on the marquee. I know you will. Mom. 
Some remember the smallest things All the verses to songs we'd sing Till the time came when everything faded away Now I think as her favorite son Is this a battle that can be won? Well, I recall doing it after it's done Well, I remember the way we dance Well, I remember our first romance Well, I remember the dresses you wear The color of your hair Well, I remember the life we made Will I remember the price we pay? Will I remember that look in your eye? Will I remember my goodbye? Awkward moments I've never had Names and faces that drive me mad Just a bit more scary than before I'll keep trying to get it right Try and get me some sleep at night And hold on till I can't hold on anymore But I'll remember the way I'll remember our first romance I'll remember the dresses you wear And the color of your hair I'll remember the life we made All the beauty, the price we pay I'll remember that look in your eyes And I'll remember my reply I'll remember that look in your eyes And I'll remember Well, Mental Matt Blues, this is, um, again, it puts me, you have a really good way musically and then lyrically, but a lot of times musically, because that's the first thing you usually hear in your, in your, in your songs is putting me in a place that I'm familiar or a place that I've seen many times depicted somewhere. So in this, this record is like hanging, you know, hanging around in a smoky bar, talking about a woman who ain't worth it. I hear you. What was the inspiration behind this particular blues instrumental? Did it start as an instrumental, and who were the players? Oh yeah, it's right. There's only two people on this on this cut. Oh, me wow. and Greg Weichel. Uh, okay, that's, that's what I it. figured. That's what I figured. Uh, I mean, you know, Greg and I were on a roll. I mean, you know, we had by the fence in the sun. Uh, we were going to eventually work on "You Ain't Never." Uh, Mental Map Blues actually started off. I, I started putting it together. Uh, with a friend by the name of Gary Miller. And Gary is an old, old buddy. Uh, you know, uh, his wife, Sue, uh, and I went to school together. Gary and I worked on lots of different educational projects. And in the latter part of his life, he started getting into his guitar and into music. And so he wrote the lyrics to a song called Mental Map Blues. And so I put together the music, sent him over some rough tracks. And before he could actually get in the studio, he passed away, which was a really sad moment. That's part, He's part of the reason why, you know, Moving On was written. But but the music was still there, and it was so, it was incomplete. All it was was you know just a, a simple rhythm track and and and, and uh, with you know drums and bass and a little bit of organ. You know, no electric guitars, no vocals, no nothing. Well, you know, uh, I I said you know I, I do not want to sing these vocals that Gary has written. You, you know, it's not like they're bad vocals; they weren't. It's just I wanted to hear him sing them, and since he's not around to sing them. Uh, you know, they're just not going to be part of the song. But I, I always wanted 
to have a blues instrumental that I could call my own. Something traditional, something, you know, that, that everybody else has played along to in one type or another, but I wanted it to be mine. And the only way I can make it mine is to have somebody who understood that, you know, right from the get-go and could actually say, all right, I'll come in with you on this one, Tom, and I'm going to put down, you know, I'm going to make this, you know, the, the rhythm parts and the lead parts, I'm going to make them mine. And but, but between the, the two of us, we're going to put together a hell of a blues song. And so that was Greg Weichel. I mean, I put together the organ parts just like I put together the organ, uh, the organ leads in uh, uh, Over the Falls. I used the Joe Vitale, you know, uh, loops and put the put that together. But Greg put uh, the acoustic, I mean, the electric rhythm parts down, and then he gave me about three different lead tracks, and, and the different lead tracks were uh, with different tones on his electric guitar. Uh, one of them was kind of straight, one was a little fuzzy, and then the other one was just rock and roll distorted. And I was able to use parts of all three of them. But, you know, Greg Greg and I were in sync on that tune right from the get-go. I mean, when I listened back, we, we both listened back just to the rough tracks with the, before mixing and stuff like that. We knew we had something special. And so that that song ended up being a great, uh, just a great instrumental, which I really love uh, still to this day. I really enjoy listening to that. And I remember watching Greg uh, putting his parts on that. It was, it was wonderful. And uh, that also was the basis uh, for um, uh, Mental Matt Blues. What, for, it, Tanya says, you know, uh, Mental Matt Blues sounds an awful lot like Over the Falls. And, you know, it's a different tempo, but the, but the chords and, the, and everything were the, like the same. I said, you know, you're absolutely right. So when we did it uh, in the concert, uh, we, we put basically the, the Mental Matt Blues, uh, without the organ, of course, uh, Mental Matt Blues stuff in there, for the music and over the falls uh, were the lyrics and it came out just rocking. I mean, it was a great song had lead parts from, uh, from Greg and from Donnie. And so we had a good time, uh, you know, doing that live when, when it came around to having the chance to do that. But yeah, it, it was in the studio. It was definitely me and Greg. Uh, and I loved mixing that. He, he just, he had a great performance. He even brought some of those licks that he put it, put on, uh, Mental Matt Blues into the concert, which I really loved. He, little, little teeny tiny things that Greg and I, only Greg and I would know that I, when he played them, I would get this shit eating grin on my face knowing where it came from. So yeah, that was, that was a two person uh, thing, but it, it turned out to be, you know, everything that I wanted it to be. Well, my next question is speaking of Greg, um, his amp, did y'all use a spring reverb in his amp or did you add reverb or did you use both? No, I, I, whenever I, I do, uh, 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 tracks like uh, electric guitar tracks, uh, even acoustic guitar tracks, my lap steel tracks, I, I put them in dry. Uh, basically, he did all of his uh, his lead work. Uh, you know, he he added the distortion. I don't I don't really particularly get into adding distortion after the fact. I think adding the distortion or having the distortion present while the person is playing offers up so many more creative moments. You know, uh, as far as the flavor of the tune and, and of course their their engagement in the playing. So, I mean, you know, so, uh, so Greg, um, you know, he, uh, basically, uh, uh, he brought over his amp. I forget which exactly what it was that he brought. I want to say there's a, fin a Fender Jazz, but that's not true. Uh, I forget, but we recorded it with a uh, Sennheiser 609, which that is my favorite all time. It's such a simple mic, but it's my favorite all time electric guitar amp mic. I mean, I've gotten more successful recording sessions out of that mic, uh, you know, uh, put up against uh, the speaker on, a, on an electric guitar amp, then I can even shake a stick. I mean, it's a great little microphone. So uh, I was able to capture his rhythm and his lead tracks there. So, um, yeah, it proves that Greg is not only uh, in the moment as far as, the, you know, the song is concerned. It shows how good an electric rhythm player and an electric lead player he really is. I hear you. That's a, that's a good one. He was really good on that one. Oh, yeah. He shined on that. I mean, and that's, you know, hard to, that's hard to do because he's really good on everything. And that that's uh, how fortuitous it was uh, way back in the day when 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 Greg and I crossed paths. I owe Bob Smith that uh, you know for for the getting us together for a recording session at his studio for a commercial, and we've been we've had that connective tissue and that magic happening ever since.
Moving on, um, there is not a truer title for an instrumental because you read the title and then you hear it and you can feel it. Now, you told us a little bit of the story just, you know, just five minutes ago. Tell us the whole thing. Well, um, that year, that year was a hard, hard year. Uh, two of the, of the most special people that I've known uh, both in, in recent part of my life and, and way back in the, in the early days, high school days of life, uh, passed on that year. One was Gary Miller. Uh, the other was Bob Young, uh, who was the, the uh, creator and the moderator and the you know, head member of my men's group. Um, and the, the impact of their passing was, you know, it's hard to measure. But I knew I, at the same time, I was, I was kind of experimenting and, and looking and and trying to sign, find, I, I wanted, I thought a keyboard would, would be the best thing. I mean, I've done things on acoustic guitar that, that could have actually maybe said what I wanted to say musically, but I, I really don't have, I, I envy the people who are into keyboards because that there's, you know, there's a, a wide variety of set of sounds and genres and stuff like that that you can go to. So I, I, what I did was I went out and I bought about three discs worth of, of piano and organ loops. I didn't really need the organ loops because I love the Joe Vitale stuff, but I wanted the piano loops. And I want you to know, I cruised through those loops for days. And all of a sudden, there was this one part, this one guy, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm ashamed and I don't remember his name, who had a, a, a whole set of progressions uh, and, and little pieces. And he, what he was playing uh, not only sounded the way I wanted it to sound, it felt the way that I wanted it to feel. It was inspirational. It was it was sad, but it also, you know, it brought about the whole concept of, uh, I guess you could say, what? Uh, if you're going to reflect, there, there should be times where you're sad, but also there should be moments of affirmation, moments where you actually remember all the good times that, that you had had with people, uh, uh, the beauty of, of everything that you had as, as people and, and the collaborations that you had, how beautiful they were, how beautiful they still are and will always remember uh, remain to be. Um, that's, that's what the piano came from. But, you know, but that's, that's not, that's not the, the, the heart, 
you know, the thing that plucks your heartstrings. To me, uh, I, I gave it to Steve. I said, Steve, I said, uh, I, I wrote this for, for a couple of people who had passed on. Um, I, I need for you to put a string part to this, you know, or, orchestra, orchestra strings. And what I want you to do is to uh, inspire and and make them cry. You know, in other words, inspire people, uh, you know, let them, you know, fall back on their memory and just really, really enjoy uh, the memory of the things and the people and, and the experiences that they had and come out of it not feeling sad, but feeling affirmed or reaffirmation of, of, of all the good feelings that they have for them and also, um, you know, musically uh, give them an experience that really means something. And he did. I think personally, it was the it was the best string part he had ever created. Uh, he he still has a lot of great string stuff in him, but that one, without a doubt, uh, when he sent me those tracks, uh, I just I just loved uh, engineering them into the song. He he is he it's it, it I would I want to say it's like his masterpiece. I know, but I know he's got more in him that that maybe there's another masterpiece coming down the road, but. That one certainly uh, is, without a doubt, uh, out of all the great string work that he's done, his, his his best shot, no doubt about it. It really was. I enjoyed hearing that, especially like the second or third time I heard it, I was like, this is really good. Well, the interesting thing about it is uh, I put that song up for, for, you know, out to a couple of companies for licensing, uh, along with a bunch of other songs. It is the only song out of the ocean of songs that, you know, the libraries of people who offer licensing opportunities. It is the only song uh, that I've ever done or put out there that was ever picked up uh, by somebody to use, um, you know, as a licensed tune. Uh, wow. and, you know, and, and the only description I could actually give is, you know, uh, uh, moving song of remembrance, uh, piano and, and, uh, and string uh, quartet. You know, uh, and that that was it. And somehow they were drawn to it. And when they heard it, they said, this is the one. So I'm really proud of that fact. But, uh, yeah, I I think it's one of the best things that Steve and I have ever done together. And it's so simple. Uh, You know, uh, there's not a lot going on. But then again, there's a whole ton of stuff going on in that song.
Well, High School Heart. This is a song we talked about before. Um, it's still a great ballad. Uh, but there's a reason why it seems so timeless on your timeline. There's a reason why this song keeps coming up. Why do you think this song resonates with your audience? I mean, it really does strike a chord. So why do you think that this song still lives and thrives in, on your timeline? Uh, a couple reasons. Um, first of all, uh, you know, whether it's adolescence or young adulthood or whatever, uh, the whole idea of struggling uh, with uh, love and and the building of relationships. Uh, the, like the the first line uh, has the has the end says hoping that you will come around, which is like you know a high school kid sitting on the on the window sill hoping that you know the person that they're in love with will come around, will drive up or come around to their house or something like that. Just you know. That uh, that naivete and and that you know young love kind of thing. Uh, the second verse deals with the fact that okay, uh, you know I know what love is all about, and you know uh, I, I try to express myself to you, uh, but you, you're looking at me like a, like I have three heads or something like that, you know. And so the the line says, hoping that you will come around, which means not drive around in your car, but come around to 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 our way of thinking, to our relationship, to our our state of being, uh, I think, and I think those things are things that a lot of people feel. I think in the in the text, not having conversations face to face world that we live in now, I, I think that it actually speaks uh, in ways that uh, that actually uh, you know cover the the ground of you know you know I'm not having conversations with people. I, I do text them. I do see them on blogs. I don't sit down with them face to face and. And really under, listen to their words and and look at their body language and and set myself bare in in, in the way that uh, you know that uh, a good conversation can actually be. I think that connects with people as well. Plus, you know, I resurrected this tune because I knew that I was going to be sending the album to uh, uh, to Nashville uh, to be mastered uh, at Master Sound, and Jonathan Russell was the guy who mastered it. Uh, is actually a Master Phonics. Um, and I wanted, I wanted that song to have a professional mastering job. So basically I sent him the unmastered version of, of the song. And so that basically he could do his mastering wizardry, uh, and actually blend the sound of that song in with the sound of all the other songs, even though it was recorded 10 years earlier, I knew that if I got it to somebody who knew what the hell they were doing, that they would be able to actually incorporate the song in a way that would make it sound like it is definitely part of the album but would also bring out uh, the not only the lyrical quality, but also uh, the instrumentation, uh, the dobro lead, uh, finger picking, things of that nature, and also the bass lick, which you uh, the transitional bass lick, which you like so much. And it, it you know it takes somebody like Jonathan to actually do that, but um, but he you know he pulled that off, and I'm really glad that I included that as as a you know a reprise, so to speak, from an earlier album because it 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 is a reflective kind of song and really you know. It's part of, uh, it, it, you know, it's part of the in entire theme of the album, I think.
live on the grave That you will awake to a better day Hoping that you will come around Come around Come around That's a good one. That's a really good one. But my favorite one on this record, my favorite, so it's got to be top five for me out of everything you've done, is American Tune. Um, I feel like it's, you know, it's people leaving America in hope to return. I feel like it's people coming to America in hopes of making a home. I feel like it's all this, all, both situations and everything in between is the American Tune. And whatever your America is. So I wasn't really certain about the theme of the song necessarily. This was my, this was me guessing based on what I could hear, but reflective certainly. So tell us what the song means and tell us what this song means to you. Well, um, Paul Simon, you know, like Dylan and James Taylor and, you know, Dan Fogelberg, Cat Stevens, uh, songwriters I really love. Um, I think it's one of his top top three tunes. The reason why I think it's top three it, is because it's timeless. Everything in there is timeless. Uh, the whole idea of how people, you know, work work away the day and yet have they go up against incredible odds. You know, their dreams are shattered. They they get tired. Uh, you know, but they're they're still going to work. Uh, uh, the the fact that the political landscape changes and people you know, a- ask themselves why in the world are we doing this? Um, you can't help but wonder what's going on, what's going wrong, uh, that kind of thing. Those kinds of things are things that people think about in every generation and in every moment in history. There are people who respond to it uh, by trying to do something positive. There are people who respond to it by singing an American tune. I mean, you know, in other words, no matter what, we're going to sing, you know, God bless America and everything is going to be all right. Those kinds of people are out there, too. Uh, And and there's a certain truth to that, which, you know, it doesn't have to be an American tune. It could be any country's tune. It could be, you know, uh, a Ukrainian tune. At at the end of the day, people go through life uh, and there are so many changes that that go on in their personal lives, in their political situation, in their financial lives. Um, uh, it says, but, you know, tomorrow is going to be another working day. And, you know, so, uh, I'm just trying to get some rest. That's all I'm trying to do is just, you know, yeah, just to get some rest so I can, you know, get up and make it through the next day. Uh, a lot of people feel that. Um, and so, you know, I, that, t- that song to me, uh, would, you know, 50 years ago, 50 years from now, will always have great importance and implication and, and, people just looking at the way that the situation happens to be in their lives at that particular time. It also was a, a benchmark thing, uh, both in the recording process and in um, the playing process. It is a cover tune and there's no way in the world, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I picked up a couple simple licks back from the early, you know, sounds of silence days of Simon and Garfunkel. Well, there's no way in the world that I could play guitar like Paul Simon. He is a masterful guitarist. I'm just a simple finger pick and simple strumming kind of guy. But there were certain things that, that he brought out, you know, that I that I took from uh, my experience with him and, uh, you know, and put toward that tune. But I also made the decision. I wanted to have a song on the album that was just me and a guitar. 
I also wanted to have a song on the album that basically allowed uh, my style to, to, to my simple, you know, finger picking style to shine through. Uh, it also showed me that, okay, I can't play like Paul Simon, but I love the song. So what in the world am I, am I, you know, putting, you know, that off for, uh, I can actually make that song my own. I mean, I don't play it like Paul Simon. I have a couple of little Paul Simon y kind of moves in it, but I don't play it like Paul Simon. But I think it my, it fits my style perfectly, and it comes across in a way that it that is genuinely mine, my interpretation of it, and I like that a lot. I also knew that you know just me and a, and a simple acoustic guitar uh, might need a little bit of enhancement, so I put down. Um, I use a, a Stevie's. Uh, AKG 414 and put down a, a basic uh, you know, finger picking track all the way through. Then I took uh, my, my pickup, my Sunrise pickup, and I actually recorded it uh, straight from the pickup uh, and put a second track on. Then <laughs> I took it over to, uh, to Todd Gallagher's studio. I mean, it's still not uh, completed yet, but he had enough. He was up and running a little bit. And, um, so basically, he had uh, uh, road mics and blue mics. So we took out a blue mic, and uh, which uh, seemed to, to really pick up a, a really nice warmth uh, of, of the presence of the guitar. And so I played the track again. And so what that particular particular cut has in it are three completely separate uh, acoustic guitar tracks, all of them played, you know, at different times. But they all sound like one track because, but well, you know me, uh, I, I love to do that kind of shit. So, uh, and I was, it offered up really wonderful, uh, you know, engineering possibilities. Uh, I also recorded um, uh, uh, some of the vocals over there at Todd's. So at the end of the day, you know, I, it ended up being a good solo tune. I wanted to have a solo tune that I could be proud of. Also, I, that's one that I actually practice on a regular basis. So I know if I ever got in front of an audience and had, you know, a good PA and all of this stuff and uh, got my F50 jumbo sitting on my lap, uh, I know I could pull that one off, you know, and make it sound really, really good. Uh, it also is in a key that fits my vocal range perfectly. So that was a very special moment. It was a great collaboration with Todd in terms of making sure that I could actually get, you know, a fuller acoustic sound. But, um, yeah, uh, that is without a doubt one of my all-time favorite cover tunes. And um, I didn't perform it all that much, uh, but, I, you know, if I ever get a chance to perform again, I will, because it's, it's a goodie. There's no doubt about it. Many's the time I've been mistaken And many times confused And I've often felt forsaken And certainly misused Ah, but it's all right It's all right I'm just weary too You don't expect to be bright and bon vivant So far away from home So far away from home I don't know a soul who's not been battered I don't have a friend who feels at ease I don't know a dream that's not been shattered Or driven to its knees Ah, but it's all right It's all right For we've lived so well so long Still, when I think of the road we're traveling on I wonder what's gone wrong can't help but wonder what's gone wrong. And I dreamed 
I was dying I dreamed that my soul rose unexpectedly And looking back down at me Smiled reassuringly And I dreamed I was flying High up above my eyes to clearly see The Statue of Liberty sailing away to sea And I dreamed I was flying They come on the ship they call the Mayflower They come on the ship that sailed the moon They come on the age's most uncertain hour And sing an American tune Ah, but it's all right It's all right We can't be forever blessed Still tomorrow's gonna be another working day And I'm trying to get some rest That's all I'm trying Get some rest Well, that leads us into 1A to American Tune, which is Say Goodbye to Me, which took me back, back to some dark places. I was like... I remember that. I remember having to just be like, this is, this relationship is stupid. This has got to end. What a, what in the world am I doing? Well, that, that is a testament to the incredible songwriting of David Edwards. Um, David and I, we talked about this. This was, uh, 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 this was the song that we created uh, 30 years earlier back in the closet at Stevie's studio at Great Bridge. Uh, you know, we put all the pieces together and, you know, it took me three decades to get a studio together enough to where I could do it and, and do something really well with it. Uh, having Tanya there to, uh, to do the vocals uh, made all the difference because Tanya knew what kind of vocal it needed. And we were able to put that together in a really, really good way. Um, but also that uh, the song itself, David is, a, is an incredibly good songwriter. He writes about about love and a lot of country themes, you know, but but he has a very real aspect to it to his writing and also he's a very emotional guy so at the end of the day uh, i i've always loved david's songs and and i wanted to honor david because we have such a long-standing uh you know writing and and recording and and performance relationship and we had just reconnected a few years earlier uh he's living you know outside of nashville so we were able to uh i was able to get a hold of donnie satterwhite I mean, there's only two instruments on that on the on the uh, on the song. It's a, a, a simple finger picking acoustic guitar, and Donnie's pedal steel. That's it. No bass, no no nothing else. Just you know, just those two instruments. But they sound really awesome together. I mean, you know. And I got Donnie. I sent him, you know, the the track, and uh, I said, you know, uh, this is for David. You know, I want to do a, a cover song, uh, you know, of David's that uh, to, to you know show him that I uh, how much I love him and how much I love his music. Donnie was all over because Donnie and I first met playing with the Herndon Edwards band. So, you know, David's an old buddy of Donnie's too, and he knows that uh, he's played on David's tunes before too. It was the perfect fit. Uh, the vocal, I mean, you know, the neat thing about it is that the music is really simple, and and the vocal, the simple ooze in the background and stuff like that are very simple. And so, you know, it, when it comes to the chorus, you're kind of wondering, well, what are they going to have? And, man, the chorus does not disappoint. I mean, you know, me and Tanya just got in there and just nailed the hell out of that. It sounded so good, and it's so much fun doing it. And David, eventually, I sent him, uh, I wanted him to have, because when we harmonize with David, it's a very special kind of sound. And so at the end of the, the very end of the song, where it goes, uh, say goodbye to me, it says, say goodbye to me, that part right there. Usually that would have been done with me and Tanya, but that particular last part was Tanya and me and David doing the three-part harmony. And you can tell the difference. 
I mean, you know, it's it's a great difference. It's a subtle difference, but it's a wonderful difference. Both uh, the three-part harmonies that Tiny and I put together and the last part that we put together with David are both sound absolutely wonderful. It was a great collaboration. I remember sending him the the rough uh, MP3 before it got mastered. Uh, said he was at a conference with his wife down in Atlanta, sitting in a hotel room, and he got it and listened to it and ended up crying. He loved it so much. So it made me feel great to be able to honor my friend uh, and colleague, uh, you know, with, with a, a really good production thing. And uh, also, you know, to continue the history that we have in such a positive way. I mean, you know, doing music with David is fun. And uh, and that song was especially uh, special with, with Donnie. I mean, you know, you can't get much better with creative nuance than Donnie Satterwhite, no matter what instrument he's playing. And of course, pedal steel is is his forte. But uh, at the end of the day, he did an absolutely masterful job on that song. Last song, You Ain't Never. Again, one of the songs that always shows up, never goes away. Big part of who you are as a rocker, you, you, that'll jump out of you every once in a while. And, you know, like High School Heart, this is always going to be one of the highlights of your career. But with the same perspective, all things being equal, what about this song do you think resonates with your audience? 
Well, I can tell you, you know, my history, uh, you know, coming down the pike, uh, before I got into my junior year in high school, uh, you know, I was I was the fat kid on the block. You know, fat kids on the block always get, uh, you know, some of the worst social treatment. I mean, I can't even imagine what it would have been like, you know, in, in social media, you know, it, if that was around at the time, I would have, I would have been destroyed. Uh, you know, so many fat Farley jokes that you can't even possibly imagine. Um, so at the end of the day, I was told by a lot of people, you know, I, I would talk to people about, hey, want well, to do this. And they would look at me like, you got three heads. Like, there's no way in the world you're going to be able to do that. You're, you're young, you're inexperienced, you're fat. There's no way in the world that you're going to be able to do anything. So, uh, so I took it, you know, I had a lot of experiences like that. So I felt like there had to be a song somewhere down the line that actually told those people, you know, uh, you ain't never going to uh, run. You ain't never going to fly. You're never going to love, you know, tell them, you know, go screw yourself because at the end of the day, you know, um, I'm going to make this happen. I don't give a shit what you say at the end of the day, you know, and Tanya really got behind me on this one too, especially the um, the second set of verses where we're actually you know in between the verses they had the little you know, the the person speaking, which is me speaking uh, the, the little uh, extra added thing. The very last line before it goes into the lead section in the end is that "Look at me, honey, I'm state of the art." Uh, it's like you know uh, y- you ain't never going to love if you don't you know take play a part of that kind of thing. Uh, in other words, uh, people who say that you can't. Well, just dismiss them because, you know, who are they? What the hell do they know about you and what you can and cannot do or have the will to do? Just dismiss them, put them off to the side, write them off as, as you know, as excess baggage and move forward. Because, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to be able to do whatever you want to do, you know, with, you know, considering, uh, you know, whatever your skill sets happen to be, just Keep on going for it, and and you'll get better. And the things that you will be able to accomplish will 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 grow as time goes on. And all those people who dismiss you, uh, I can tell you, uh, it goes all the way back to when Tanya and I got married. The people who actually came to our destination wedding in Floyd, they had a they had a fucking you know uh, betting pool. And you know. What part of the first six months are these people going to break up? They didn't put us to lasting more than six months, you know, because Tony and I were kind of, kind of, you know, feisty. We had our, our moments. We would argue and stuff like that. But, it, you know, uh, they misinterpreted all that. You know, that was our way of feeling, feeling our way through. It never got violent. It never got nasty. It was just us, you know, trying to find a way. And we found a way. So screw them. I mean, they're my buddies and stuff like that. But if you don't believe in this, hey, I don't need you to believe in this. We believe in this. So, uh, you know, that 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 song was written for people who who have always been told you can't. But I'm telling you right now, you can. And and you should you should not listen to the people who who actually dismiss you as being less than or insignificant, because at the end of the day, uh, you will triumph in the end. And, you know, all they're going to be able to do is just sit back and eat your dust. So the hell with them. You ain't never going to run. You ain't never going to run. You ain't never gonna run Just drop to one knee and wait for the gun You ain't never gonna fly You ain't never gonna fly You ain't never gonna fly Just push down the throttle and say bye-bye You ain't never gonna love You ain't never gonna love you ain't never gonna love Hey, just what kind of reason are you thinking of? Ooh, la, la, la. 
If you never decide, you ain't never gonna run. Till you learn how to glide, you ain't never gonna run. Let it flow from inside. Nothing feels better than catching your stride. You ain't never gonna fly with your feet on the ground. You ain't never gonna fly if you don't come around. You ain't never gonna fly. What you'll see is profound. Life is made for cruising at the speed of sound. You ain't never gonna love if you shut down your heart. You ain't never gonna love if you never take part. You ain't never gonna love if you don't play it smart. Hey, look at me, honey, I'm state of the art. Well, that's it, man. How you feel? Any last words? I mean, it's a great record. How do you feel about, can, well, let me phrase it like this. When everything was done at the time, how do you feel? How did you feel then? And how do you feel now? Well, I was really excited to send this thing off to Jonathan because uh, uh, Master Phonics had the reputation of being one of the top five mastering studios in Nashville. And, and he was young. Uh, we connected uh, uh, on the uh, emails and on the phone. He knew exactly what I was looking for, um, and he delivered that. I was so happy to hear. Uh, there was only one thing he did that I took issue with, and he fixed it, you know, in a New York minute. He sent me back uh, by the fence in the sun without the uh, the little intro thing, you know, the countdown and the little Greg and I talking at the very end of it after the guitars and everything die out which right. I thought was really a critical part of, uh, of understanding that that was live and in color and in the moment. So he said, oh, I'm sorry. So he sent me back, uh, you know, the, the finished product with that in there. He did a great job. Um, and so when I finished the project, uh, I knew that sending it to to Jonathan at Master Finance was going to be, make it something really, really special. It would make it, uh, you know, radio airplay worthy. It would make it, it would make it fuller. It would round out all the the major tones, especially the bottom end tones, you know, kick drum, bass drum, uh, low end of my guitar, those kinds of things. It was going to actually do a really good job of that and, and giving it that full sound. So, yeah, I was I was really excited. I was not only excited about that, but I was excited for the people that uh, that played on it, because when I mixed it, I I wanted to make sure that every single thing that they did could be heard. I wanted to make sure that their performances resonated as as clear as a bell. I mean, but also were part of the whole. Uh, that takes time, especially with vocals, uh, to allow people to be able to hear every single voice in the mix, but also have it uh, resonate as a, a huge, gigantic, singular sound. Uh, it, it takes time to to be able to pull that off. But then again, I was retired. I had the time. So you know, all the mixing and, and engineering and production experience before. Uh, all I had to be was patient and I was patient. And and when I finally got to the point where I needed it to be, and then, you know, gave that final listen with Tanya and she just had this grin on her face. I knew. So, um, I was really proud of the fact that we were able to pull that off, um, and also establish, you know, such really, really, uh, strong 
uh, performance relationships, uh, you know, again, with the people who I'd done it before and kind of re reinforced all of that stuff, but with the new people, you know, the Richards and, uh, and the Joannas of the world, uh, uh, basically, um, and also even Greg, uh, it, it, it set in stone the fact that, uh, when we, when we get together, there could be some serious magic happening and, uh, it still continues that way. Well, sir, that was amazing. Thank you for your insight on your own work because your own work is very, very good. It's great. Well, thank you, brother. I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. You know, I, um, thank you for asking, uh, you know, the right questions. And, and uh, I apologize for getting all mushy on, on you for a few times. But at the end of the day, uh, this, this one really goes to a lot of the core of my being, you know, so to speak, uh, and uh, a lot of the uh, emotional um, energy. I, I listened to it a few times too in preparation for us getting together today, and it brought back some really, some really great feelings. Uh, but also, um, you know, uh, it uh, well, it also you know would we'll, we'll lay the groundwork for when we do the high energy acoustics band, which was uh, some of these songs were done live. So, and also those personnel could be heard live. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to the next one, but this one was exceptionally special because it, it is a special album. Well. That is another episode of the Path Taken. Um, this is a this is a exceptional record. I'm glad we had a chance to talk about it. I am Alton Riddick, and for Tom Farley, we'll see y'all next time. Thanks for listening, in, folks. This episode was produced by Tom Farley and Alton Riddick. Edited and mixed by Alton Riddick for Edit Your Truth. On behalf of Tom, this is Alton signing off until we meet again on The Path Taken. Music.